please join me in welcoming Professor Adam Gamerin. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. It turns out that if you serve on or chair a number of National Research Co Council committees, every once in a while they let you have a meeting here in Woods Hole. <laughs> and uh, several of my, uh, f we have a committee meeting starting tomorrow, and several of my fellow committee me members are honoring me by, by coming tonight. Uh, they'll be the ones pointing out my mistakes at the end. <laughs> Um, and, uh, but, but the luckiest thing about this uh, meeting is they gave us such a lovely time to be here. What a, what a wonderful time to be in this area. So I'm uh, really, really pleased to have this opportunity. Of course, it turns out that uh, they let us have the meeting space at this wonderful time and host us, everything's beautiful, but then you got to work. <laughs> so here I am, here I am this evening. In 2002, an extraordinary federal law raised the stakes for high, high standards in U.S. education. The No Child Left Behind Act required states to set absolute targets for student performance and to hold schools accountable for reaching those targets. So today I will try to address questions about the successes and failures of No Child Left Behind. And we'll take a look at the consequences of No Child Left Behind for equity, because an emphasis on standards often leaves issues of equity behind. Finally, we will ask what changes occurred during the Obama administration. Well, this is Massachusetts. Can I say during the first Obama administration? <laughs> anyway, what changes have occurred so far under the Obama administration, and will those changes reduce achievement gaps. Now, you may have noticed that the title of my talk is The Looming Demise of No Child Left Behind. And as I will explain, No Child Left Behind is effectively over. And so we'll be looking at what is replacing it, what are the implications for inequality of uh, the changes brought by No Child Left Behind and the changes that are coming after it. So to understand no Child Left Behind, you need to understand two aspects of U.S. education that are really distinctive, different than most other countries. The first is the loosely coupled organization of education in the United States, and the second is the high degree of inequality uh, that characterizes education in the United States. So first of all, uh, U.S. education operates as a loosely coupled system. There is little supervision, no formal inspection. You know, in many other countries, they send out school inspectors to see if teachers and principals are doing a job. Not in the United States. We have a strong norm of autonomy among teachers. Close the classroom door, teacher is in charge. Schooling does not operate through commands and supervision, but rather it operates under a shared understanding of what each teacher is supposed to be doing in her classroom. Moreover, in the United States, unlike many other countries, leaving tests, by that I mean tests that you take when you leave school, are, delib are deliberately not tied to the curriculum. Now, there was a reason for that. Uh, things are so diffuse in the United States, so uh, decentralized, that there was a belief that you couldn't have one test that examined all students because they might be exposed to different curricula. So it wouldn't be fair. So it's supposed to compensate this lack, uh, this, uh, these tests that are not tied to the school curricula are supposed to compensate for unequal learning opportunities. But of course, inequality is still present, but it's obscured. So we have students taking the SAT tests, the ACT tests, and these tests are important predictors of who goes to which college, uh, and they're not based on any particular curriculum of any particular school, but of course there are strong relationships between students' opportunities for learning in school and their post-secondary opportunities. Now, we often hear how poorly our students perform compared to those in other countries. But the main problem in the United States 
is not one of levels of performance, but the degree of inequality in student performance. So here's an example of what I'm talking about. This bar graph shows performance on the trends in math and science study, an international assessment that's given approximately every three years. This is grade four mathematics from 2007, but other, other uh, administrations of this test would have served just as well. There's the United States, approximately the middle of the distribution, right around the other, right around uh, other Western European countries like the England, Netherlands, Germany, Australia, uh, Australia, not Western European, but in the same cluster. Um, substantially below the Far Eastern countries such as Singapore, Taiwan, Japan. These are not all the countries that took the TIMS assessment. If, just if I tried to fit them all on, it would be too crowded to see anything. So I, I just uh, did some selection. But the performance of the U.S. is in the middle. But uh, this down here, that's, that's Algeria. So you see a, a few countries, very low performance, uh, generally developing countries. Otherwise, the United States is with other Western countries in the middle of the distribution. But this blue bar over on the right side is the average performance of students in school districts where fewer than 10% of the children are receiving free or reduced price lunch. And you can see that it is equal to the top performing countries in the world. And the red bar is the average performance of students in school districts where 75% or more of the children are receiving free or reduced price lunch. And their performance, while not as far down as Algeria, are among the lowest, con lowest performing Western countries. So uh, the performance of groups of students is highly sensitive to the context and to the backgrounds of individual students. And there's an exceptionally high degree of inequality in performance in the United States. We see the same thing if we look at post-secondary performance. So this is a headline from the New York Times, once a leader, US lags in college degrees. About 42% of US young people earn college degrees, either associates or bachelor's degrees. We were once the highest proportion in the world. The US is now 12th. That's because we have stopped accelerating and other countries have caught up to us. Um, but this, this, um, this finding also obscures the degree of inequality. 53% uh, of young people in Massachusetts have college degrees, 40% in Wisconsin, where I come from, and 26% in Arkansas. Massachusetts, if, if, if you were a country here in Massachusetts, you'd be first in the world in proportion of, high, of college degrees. Arkansas would be 28th in the world. The United States as a whole is 12th. So once again, the problem is not so much one of where the level is, but the dispersion of performance, the high degree of inequality. And similar gaps, so these are, are gaps by state, but uh, similar gaps exist by ethnicity and by socioeconomic status. So No Child Left Behind was an effort to raise standards and hold schools accountable to address some of these problems. Standards for student performance, which involved annual testing in grades three through eight, in reading and in mathematics. The, the measure of success is known as adequate yearly progress. Uh, school, students must hit a proficiency target on the achievement test. In other words, there's a certain point on the test which is judged proficient. If you reach this score, you're judged to be proficient in reading or mathematics. And then uh, the percentage of students meeting that target increases every year under No Child Left Behind. Uh, what's demanded under No Child Left Behind is increases in pr pr uh, progress towards proficiency for all students, including a variety of demographic subgroups, whites, blacks, Latinos, Asians, American Indians, students on free and reduced price lunch, le English language learners, I can't talk fast enough, students with disabilities. E e students in each of these groups must reach 100% proficiency by 2013-2014. That was the expectation of No Child Left Behind. 
And there are consequences for failing to meet these standards. In the first year, uh, and the, after two years of failing to meet these standards, uh, uh, schools were required to put into place an improvement plan, uh, professional development for teachers, and to allow students the option to transfer to other schools that were not failing adequate yearly progress at the school district expense. After three years, the first set of sanctions continues, plus schools were required to provide what was called supplemental services, which means free tutoring for struggling students. After four years, corrective action could be taken, which could be anything from firing the principal, dismissing the teachers, converting to a charter school, all sorts of pretty serious sanctions for schools that failed to hit their proficiency targets four years in a row. Now, No Child Left Behind has had at least two accomplishments. First is that it has highlighted inequalities between subgroups of students. So for example, the school that my children attend, uh, attended, they're grown now, uh, the school that my children attended did very well on average every year. And we used to pat ourselves on the back for that. But when No Child Left Behind came out, what we discovered was there was a group of students on free and reduced price lunch who did not perform so well in our school. And we had to stop patting ourselves on the back because even though on average performance looked good, once we started looking at all these subgroups, performance did not look so good. So No Child Left Behind showcased these inequalities. And of course, the first step towards solving any problem is recognizing that there is a problem. And No Child Left Behind helped us with that. The second, the second contribution is that No Child Left Behind has motivated teachers and principals to seek new ways to promote higher achievement. So in studies of implementation, when we've asked teachers, how has the new accountability system affected you, one of the most common answers was to say, I'm looking for new ways to teach so that my children will perform better on these state assessments. Now, uh, the same implementation studies that have gone into classrooms and looked at what teachers are doing have found that there have been few actual changes in what's going on in the classrooms. So the motivation is there, but the action to follow it has not been there. And uh, that will be part of my story. But nonetheless, I maintain that No Child Left Behind has had two positive consequences, highlighting inequalities between subgroups and motivating teachers and principals to try to uh, uh, improve student performance. Now, um, many people have pointed out that No Child Left Behind has tended to narrow the focus within schools. For example, uh, if you are a teacher and you are being held to account for your children's performance in some curriculum, you're likely to focus in on that curriculum. So if we have children who are not able to read, the fact that teachers are emphasizing reading might be a good thing. But if we're also concerned that children should learn science or that they should have opportunities to express themselves creatively through art or music, well, there are fewer such opportunities consequent, uh, subsequent to No Child Left Behind. Uh, in addition, another concern with No Child Left Behind is that so the measure of success is the percent of students who hit some threshold, proficiency. So if you're a teacher and you're trying to maximize the credit that your school gets, what you need to do is grab those kids who are just below the accountability threshold and push them just over the accountability threshold, right? The kids who are above the accountability threshold, well, they're doing fine. Who cares about them? And the kids who are way far below the accountability threshold, well, they're a lost cause. They're not going to, it's not that they're a lost cause, literally, it's just they're not going to help you in the accountability system. So several studies have suggested that there's greater focus on kids who are close to that threshold and as opposed to on the whole distribution of students. So that, that's, uh, those are two ways in which No Child Left Behind has narrowed the focus. In addition, uh, the implementation study I mentioned earlier has found lower teacher morale. For example, teachers on this survey were five times more likely to say morale is worse than to say it is better as a result of the new accountability system. However, other studies 
have shown that the imposition of high standards does not drive good teachers out of teaching. And this uh, was a big concern. And uh, this finding comes from a study that looked at different states, some of which adopted accountability, accountability measures earlier and some that adopted accountability measures later. And the study did not find a migration of teachers from places where they would be under tighter accountability to places where they'd be under looser accountability. Now, what about effects on achievement? That's the whole point here. No Child Left Behind was supposed to elevate student performance. Did that happen? Well, scores on our national assessments are up. And achievement gaps, since No Child Left Behind was passed, some of the achievement gaps are smaller. Now, does that mean No Child Left Behind caused those changes? After all, a lot of things have been going on in the United States since 2002 when No Child Left Behind was passed. So was it No Child Left Behind or something else that caused these modest improvements? Probably No Child Left Behind did have some causal role, and I'll give you some of the evidence for that in a minute. But the main issue here is that whatever the role of No Child Left Behind in elevating performance and reducing gaps, these gains have fallen far, far short of the goals of No Child Left Behind. And the strategies advocated by No Child Left Behind have been weakly implemented. So this is a diagram <clears throat> from a federal government report showing uh, performance on the National Assessment of Education Progress. It's uh, uh, an assessment that's given to a sample of students all around the country. So it's not useful for accountability purposes, but it is useful for monitoring performance over time. It's like applying a thermometer to the educational achievement of children. So this is uh, the, from reading achievement for nine-year-olds, and we're focusing on the black-white achievement gap. The top line represents white children. The bottom line represents uh, African-American children. And uh, that red arrow is when No Child Left Behind went into effect. And so you can see that for the two decades prior to No Child Left Behind, performance was pretty flat. And during the decades since No Child Left Behind, performance has accelerated, particularly for African American children. So this is a pattern that would be consistent with someone who's trying to argue that No Child Left Behind has raised achievement and closed the gap. Uh, we see a similar pattern, somewhat muted, not quite as strong, for the black-white gap in mathematics at age 13. Uh, again, that's where No Child Left Behind went into place. About 15 years prior to No Child Left Behind, performance was pretty flat. And then it goes upward a little bit after No Child Left Behind was passed. So maybe something was going on with student achievement during the No Child Left Behind years. Now, um, one problem with testing the causal role of No Child Left Behind is that No Child Left Behind went into place for the whole country at the same time. So there's no way, you can't compare the United States to the not United States to see the effect of No Child Left Behind. But many states had No Child Left Behind-like accountability systems prior to 2002. This, for example, is from an article by uh, Eric Hanyashek and Margaret Raymond, uh, and it displays um, the growth over time in state imposition of accountability systems. The shadow are the number of states that had report cards, but that doesn't mean very much because there were no, not necessarily sanctions attached to the report cards. The darker number here, they refer to as consequential systems. So these were accountability systems that actually had some consequences. So that's kind of like No Child Left Behind. So you can see that there are four states in 1993, and it grew to about 25 states by 1999. 2002, when No Child Left Behind was passed, there were already 28 states with some uh, type of accountability system that was very similar to what No Child Left Behind was like. You, you may be aware that Texas was the model for No Child Left Behind, so there was certainly one of these systems in, in Texas. Um, so, uh, so we can use the fact that No Child Left Behind was sort of already implemented before 2002 in some states and compare it to the states where 
there was nothing like it beforehand to see whether No Child Left Behind had an effect. And that is what Thomas D. and Brian Jacob have done in an article in the Journal of Policy and Management Analysis. Policy Analysis and Management. Um, so the, let's see, the dashed line here represents states that already had a kind of a No Child Left Behind system in before No Child Left Behind, here and here. And what you can see is that for those states, it's pretty, pretty much a constant trajectory before and after No Child Left Behind. By contrast, so the solid line are states that did not have no child left behind accountability system before 2002, but were required to put such a system into a place when no child left behind was passed. And for these states, you can see there was a flatter trajectory in achievement growth prior to no child left behind and a steeper trajectory after no child left behind. And again, this is grade four math achievement on the National Assessment of Education Progress. So Dee and Jacob argue, and I think with some justification, that this suggests that No Child Left Behind actually had a causal role. So it's not just the change from before 2002 to after 2002, but actually something about the states that were already doing what No Child Left Behind made all states do um, that, that accounted for this, for this difference. So No Child Left Behind may have modestly contributed to higher achievement and smaller ga achievement gaps. But as I said before, <clears throat> the goals have far fallen, or the uh, improvement has fallen far, far short of goals. And one of the major reasons is that No Child Left Behind's um, strategies for improvement were poorly implemented. So achievement gains have fallen far short of goals. And one of the main reasons is weak and inconsistent implementation of strategies for improvement under No Child Left Behind, which have limited the chances for success. You see, the thing about No Child Left Behind, we always talk about the high standards and the sanctions applied to schools that are not meeting those standards, but there was a lot more to No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind had a number of ideas in it about what schools and teachers should do to improve student learning. Unfortunately, those ideas were so weakly and inconsistently implemented that they didn't have their desired effects. So I'll give you two examples. Two of No Child Left Behind's really good idea. One, place a highly qualified teacher in every classroom. That seems like a good idea. And two, providing free tutoring for low-achieving, low-income students. So the high, highly qualified provision, highly qualified teacher provision. Uh, the criteria, what, what No Child Left Behind meant by highly qualified was te all teachers should have a college degree, be certified as teachers, and be competent in the subject matter you're teaching. Now that may seem like obvious to you, but in fact, many teachers, especially at middle and secondary levels, teach out of field, meaning they teach subjects for which they're not professionally certified. It, particularly prior to No Child Left Behind. So um, many previous studies have shown that low-income students have less access to fully qualified teachers according to the criteria of No Child Left Behind. So No Child Left Behind's high, highly qualified teacher provision would address that and presumably if it were strongly implemented would help address some of the inequalities that we've observed. But under No Child Left Behind, states using tests to assess subject matter competence differed in what they counted as competent. Many states simply declared all certified teachers to be competent, to, to be highly qualified teachers. Uh, so my colleague Andy Porter has written an article in which he says, being a highly qualified teacher depends on what state the teacher is in. In other words, uh, what's a highly qualified teacher in Wisconsin might not be a highly qualified teacher in Massachusetts. That's actually a real world example. So, um, uh, no, so the highly qualified teacher provision, while a really good idea, was not implemented consistently across the country. Second example, supplemental educational services, which means tutoring. One-on-one -on -one tutoring is the best known strategy for helping low achievers catch up. It's one of the educational strategies with the strongest evidence of success. And No Child Left Behind requires 
schools that have failed adequately progress for three years to make such tutoring available. In principle, it seems like an excellent strategy for closing the achievement gaps. But under No Child Left Behind, unfortunately, weak implementation has limited success. For example, only 20% of the students who are eligible for supplemental educational services have actually received it. And this has been shown in a number of studies. Moreover, even the kids who are receiving the free tutoring don't show up. Attendance is poor. In addition, group sizes are large. So the research says that one-on-one -on -one tutoring, maybe one teacher with two children or, or, or a tutor with three, uh, those are effective. But under No Child Left Behind, very often it was six, eight, 10, 12 students per tutor. That's not tutoring. That's another class. So not surprisingly, uh, the free tutoring has not worked out as expected. In addition, even though who can be a teacher is tightly regulated under No Child Left Behind, who can be a tutor is not declared. So in some uh, states, uh, you have to be a certified teacher to be a tutor. In other states, you have to have a high school diploma. So no consistent standards for who can be a tutor. And finally, you might think that if the purpose of the tutoring was to help children catch up with their classroom performance, that the tutors and the teachers would talk to each other. But that, was very, that has been very inconsistent under No Child Behind. Poor coordination uh, with teachers. Finally, the quality of the tutoring is not monitored. So some of the tutoring is probably very good, excellent. Some of the tutoring, probably not so good. We don't really know because it's not been monitored. So disappointingly, tutoring under No Child Behind has had very small impact, much smaller effects than has been shown in a variety of studies of tutoring where the focus is, is on tutoring. Well, whatever its successes and failures, the end of No Child Left Behind is at hand. President Obama declared that four out of five schools will soon be labeled as failing under No Child Left Behind. Apologists for No Child Left Behind say, oh, no, 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 this is exaggerated. No, this is accurate. In fact, we can go farther. By 2013, 2014, in, and sooner in most states, Virtually all schools will fail to make adequate yearly progress. No Child Left Behind will collapse by 2014 due to the unrealistic goal of 100% proficient and the hard deadline of 2014. In 2008-2009, one-third of schools failed to make adequate yearly progress. In 2010-2011, nearly half of all schools failed to meet the target. In 2013-14, virtually all schools will miss the mark. When No Child Left Behind was first passed in 2002, I gave a talk which I have subsequently given in many states and in many countries around the world. And this is what I said. No school in the US has ever made the degree of progress that the typical school will have to make to meet the demands of No Child Left Behind. And I've said this again and again, and I'm waiting for someone to say, no, 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 my school, and that way I could change my talk. I could say, only one school has ever met. The I, haven't found, I haven't found that school. That, that school. So I'll, uh, to illustrate this point, I'll show you the situation in my state, Wisconsin. The... Um, um, so you, you remember that the end point of No Child Left Behind is that by 2013, 2014, 100% of students hit the proficiency target, right? So we know the end point. We know the end point, okay? Uh, but what's the beginning, or how do we get there? What's the beginning point and how do we get there? Well, in my state, Wisconsin, this is, this is the line for how we get there. See, we in Wisconsin, we're very smart. We didn't want to face a tough situation at the beginning. So we created the stair-step approach. So in Wisconsin, between 2002 and 2010, schools had to increase their percent of students proficient by seven percentage points every three years. 
Beginning in 2010, so last year, now we have to increase the percent of students proficient by seven percentage points every year. So what hap uh, So um, this dotted line up here is the actual performance in Wisconsin. Uh, and, and by the way, this is the average performance in the state, but what we really should be looking at is the average of the school averages. But it, it would be uh, very much the same. So the average performance in the school has been, and this is grade four reading, has been flat. Um, meanwhile, so the average school has had nothing to worry about. Right? Some schools are, because this is the average, so there are some above and some below. But uh, the average school has had nothing to worry about since f between 2002 and 2008. Now in 2008, that, that, so that's what I project out for beyond 2011 uh, to 2014. So that means that we have a train wreck. Um, so that's the story with uh, um, ad adequate yearly progress in Wisconsin. Now, by the way, down here, these green dots, these are the percent proficient for the state of Wisconsin on the national assessment of education progress. So here's the percent proficient on our state test. Here's the percent proficient on NAEP. Okay. Why is there such a, a big difference? It's because Wisconsin, we have an easy cut score. We make it really easy for school. So in Wisconsin, only 11% in uh, 2010, before we hit the wall here, only 11% of schools were failing No Child Left Behind. You know what it is in Massachusetts? 89%. Or, eight, sorry, 81%. Why is that? Because you have tough standards in Massachusetts. We have easy standards in Wisconsin. That has just changed. Within the last month, Wisconsin has recalibrated its standards so that we are now like the NAEP standards, the National Assessment of Education Progress Standards, much more like Massachusetts. And next year, a much higher proportion of Wisconsin schools would have failed No Child Left Behind had we not found an escape hatch, which I'm about to tell you about. Anyway, that's the, that's the reading situation. Situations similar in math. There's actually been a slight improvement in the math scores. So it's a slight upward trajectory, but obviously nowhere near the steepness of the upward trajectory that's required under No Child Behind. So if, if we project out scores, we can see that it's maybe a year or two later that we'd hit the wall in Wisconsin, but uh, nonetheless. Also, um, our... Uh, our percent proficient was a little more challenging in math and reading, but still far short of uh, you know, much below the, what we say our percent proficient is uh, on our state test. So the Obama administration, the first Obama administration, has come up with several strategies for improvement. Four main, uh, three, uh, come up with several strategies for improvement. Um, which include common standards and assessments, a focus on achieving growth as well as on uh, perform uh, levels of performance, uh, and radical reforms to turn around low-performing schools. So uh, the first thing the administration did was to put out a booklet called a Blueprint for Reform. And over time, the administration has taken increasing steps to encourage states to adopt these measures. And they've used a a combination of carrots and sticks to adopt these measures um, to get out of the no trial left behind situation. So first, with respect to new standards and, asses and assessments, under no trial left behind, each state has its own standards and assessments. And that means there are varying standards across states. As I just explained, Massachusetts has rigorous standards. Wisconsin had easy standards. So you could be a much weaker performing student to be considered proficient in Wisconsin. Same student in Massachusetts would not be considered proficient. So under the Obama administration, uh, states have received incentives for adopting common standards and assessments to be eligible for certain federal grant opportunities big federal grant opportunities, states have been encouraged to adopt a common set of rigorous standards. And in fact, 45 states have adopted these standards. They're called the Common Core State Standards in Reading and Mathematics. And now there are two groups which have 
received collectively about $360 million to prepare assessments that will measure performance against these standards. And almost all states are aligned with one or the other of these two groups. Uh, many states are connected to both of them. So ultimately, these groups will compete to see which states will adopt their assessments. Now, under No Child Left Behind, the focus was on achievement at a particular point in time. So is this school making adequate yearly progress? Well, where are the students performing today? That means that a school with a challenging population might have low test scores, not because it's a bad school, but because children from different circumstances uh, outside the school, home, neighborhood, perform differently than children from more advantaged circumstances. Under No Child Left Behind, no credit for that. Under the Obama administration, the idea is to focus not only on where students are performing, but how much progress an individual student makes from one year to the next. So, um, uh, so instead of holding schools accountable for what they cannot control, which is the performance of students when they get to the school, before they start, the new idea is to hold them accountable for what is more under their control, which is how much did they learn over the course of the school year. So the priority is to focus on achieving growth as well as status. So uh, uh, many states are adopting what's called value-added achievement models. This means, achievement, uh, this means statistical models that make it possible to judge what uh, schools or teachers are contributing to student performance. And uh, what's new here is not just using value added to evaluate schools, but also to evaluate teachers. Now, uh, there was a big competition, a $4 billion competition called Race to the Top, which required states to use student test scores to evaluate teachers. So many states um, did not think this was a good idea previously. And my state, Wisconsin, used to have a law that says it is forbidden to use test scores to evaluate teachers. Well, we overturned that law so that we could compete for Race to the Top. We didn't win Race to the Top, but now we have a, a possibility of judging teacher performance in part on how much growth their students make from one year to the next. So $4 billion was allocated to states showing the most promise of reform. This was uh, a number of aspects to this were highly contested. One of the uh, most highly contested was that um, uh, previously, education funding was always given out to states on the basis of formula. What was new here is that states actually competed, and the states that had made more progress in reform got more money. So uh, giving the successful states more. So um, on the one hand, you know, uh, helping the states that are already farther along get farther, get even farther along. On the, other, on the other hand, it provided incentives for a lot of states like mine, which were far behind in advancing reforms, an incentive to move in that direction. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, states are using value-added models, that is, models that check out how much value schools and teachers apply, um, provide to student learning, not just for schools, but also for teacher evaluation. And one thing that research has shown in the last two, three years is that simple pay for performance models do not work. We now have convincing evidence from New York, from Chicago, from Nashville, Tennessee, showing that if you simply offer to pay teachers more, if their students get higher test scores, uh, you don't see a general increase in student performance. I'll just give you one example. I can, tell, I can say more about it uh, afterwards if people are interested. But in Nashville, for example, they said, OK, who wants to be part of this study? We're going to uh, randomly select teachers to be in, uh, in this treatment group. And if you're randomly selected, then you'll get a higher pay. You'll get big bonuses, up to $15,000 bonuses, uh, if your students have high test scores. So a lot of teachers volunteered. And then they said, OK, we're going to do random assignment. And they randomly said to half, the, half of the group, OK, you're, you are eligible for the bonus. And the other half of the group, they said, not eligible for the bonus. And then they, so no matter how well your student perform, you don't get a bonus. 
You guys, if your students perform better, you get a bonus, big bonus. So after three years, they monitored student performance, and the average performance in the two groups was not different, irrespective of this opportunity for bonuses. So um, now, pay for performance may help get effective teachers where they're most needed. So I would say the book is not totally closed on pay for performance, not useful at elevating the general level of performance, but it may be a strategy for saying, okay, we need better teachers in this district because the students are really struggling. We're going to identify uh, high performers, let's say, in the suburbs and give them a big incentive to come teach in the city. So it may still work for that. We don't know. Um, in addition, it may be that pay for perform uh, that increased pay isn't enough. After all, if teachers were primarily motivated by money, they probably wouldn't be teachers. <laughs> so we, we maybe need improved working conditions, uh, opportunities to interact with colleagues, opportunities for new learning, um, supplies, materials for the classroom, other kinds of uh, supports that could help teachers improve in addition to the, the pay. So there are possibilities for pay for performance, but simple plans, pretty convincing, do not work. Uh, so. Um, Combined with other information, it may still be useful to use information on what teachers have added to student achievement growth as part of the decision about uh, giving teachers tenure, keeping them in the system. So that's another uh, possible use for these teacher evaluation models. Um, now, uh, finally, the blueprint for reform and the subsequent strategies enacted by the current administration have focused on turning around the performance of the schools that have the lowest level of student achievement or persistently low performing schools. And among the strategies are transformation, which means replace the principal, implement new instructional models and new governance systems. Or turnaround, replace the principal and the teachers, bring in new uh, instruction and governance systems. Restart, close the school, reopen it as a charter school. Or finally, transfer students to another school. So these were some uh, turnaround strategies offered in the blueprint for reform. Now, these strategies perhaps show some promise, but the evidence is too limited to judge their, uh, to judge their effectiveness. Um, now, despite the blueprint and the succession of increasing uh, incentives for states to adopt these new measures, Congress has not taken up the call to revise and renew No Child Left Behind. So the administration is stuck with a law that is about to become meaningless. As I explained, pretty soon all schools under No Child Left Behind would be judged failing. So an accountability system that says everybody fails is useless as an accountability system. Uh, so what are you going to do? Well, the administration has figured out that they can get the, the law allows uh, the Department of Education to waive certain provisions of the No Child Left Behind uh, law subject to certain conditions. So these state waivers provide a way out of this trap for the current administration. So the administration is willing to waive two key features, the 100% proficiency requirement and the 2014 deadline. That's really important. Those are the two reasons I said it's about to collapse. So if you waive those provisions, then it might not collapse. Um, what does the administration demand in return? Well, a state seeking a waiver must design its own accountability system. And this accountability system must have certain characteristics, and you're going to recognize them based on what I've been saying in the last 15 minutes. Uh, the new accountability system that a state adopts must focus on achievement growth in addition to the level of achievement. The state must adopt rigorous standards and assessments. The state must assess teachers as well as schools, or the state must hold teachers as well as schools accountable. And finally, the state must devote resources to turning around the lowest performing schools. Exactly the provisions that the administration's been focusing on for the previous two, two to three years. 
So far, waivers have been approved for 33 states. That means 33 states have designed new accountability systems, uh, have had the 2014 deadline and the 100% provision requirement waived in exchange for bringing on these new provisions. So what response has this generated from Congress? Well, Congress has, in fits and starts, Congress has discussed changes to No Child Left Behind. Uh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention, No Child Left Behind was passed in or signed into law in 2002. It was supposed to be reauthorized in 2007. So we're five years behind schedule. Still, Congress has uh, discussed changes many times. Various uh, important congressional actors have offered um, uh, language that could be part of a reauthorization, but No Child Left Behind was passed with a bipartisan agreement, and those are much harder to come by today than they were in 2001. So um, to say there will be no quick resolution, I think, is kind of an understatement. So what implication do these changes that uh, upon whose doorstep we are treading um, have for inequality in education in the United States? Well, first of all, one of the biggest dimensions of inequality is inequality across states. And if states adopt common standards and common assessments, this will help to reduce that be between state inequality. Moreover, deeper and more coherent standards may bring special benefits to disadvantaged students who often uh, lack opportunities for such rich learning in environments outside of school. Moreover, the focus on achievement growth will identify schools and teachers more, accuracy, more accurately. Right now, we're mixing up effective and ineffective schools. We're identifying schools where performance is low as ineffective man, when that may be completely wrong. And we're identifying schools where performance is high as effective and that may be equally wrong. We need to focus on what progress young people are making, not just where their scores are in an absolute sense. So that, uh, that change will also help. And this will allow policymakers to target resources where they are needed. So th the schools that will be subject to sanctions will be not those where performance is low, but where performance is low and there's a lack of growth. That, uh, those are the schools that need to be turned around. So uh, in that case, we'll be able to close schools and terminate teachers that cannot be improved. Uh, and this will also provide incentives to bring effective teachers to high need schools, or at least in principle it will. We'll see if it works. Now, school turnaround efforts those dramatic changes, transformation, turnaround, transfer. Um, these efforts could do the most of all to help disadvantaged students, but only if they succeed. The record so far is not very good. For example, there's been research on charter schools. And the most consistent finding of the research on charter schools is that charter schools are variable. Some are more effective than the regular schools from which they're drawing students and some are less effective. So it's all about implementation. Remarkable changes have been occurring already in US education policy. Tighter regulations, more incentives, and less local autonomy. In my judgment, NCLB, NCLB made important progress, but it was not designed to succeed. What about the new approaches? Will they succeed? Well, I think it depends on implementation. Implementation was a weak point for NCLB. But we can learn a lot from NCLB's shortcomings. Inequality can be addressed, not quickly enough to satisfy everyone, but enough to make a real difference for disadvantaged students. Thank you. Yes. I just want to pick up on your point that 